that the Lord has made. So God, we bless you. Be our CC. Say, God, have your way. Yes, God. So Heavenly Father, bless your people. Bless the song that was sung. Joy that was shared, God, please receive it. We love you. Truly, we have come to worship you, O oh God. Teach us how to worship in spirit and in truth, O oh God. Hallelujah. Bless the word today. Bless our offering. Bless our praise. Bless whatever we do in here, God. In Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. The church say amen again. Amen. So good morning. Be our CC. Uh, let me say that one more time. Be our CC. Be ready for the coming of Christ. Amen. Amen. It's easy how, how, how people can make a mark on communities. Whenever I stay and say be our CC, you say be ready for the coming of Christ. Yeah. Uh, think about Seth uh, Lamas. He's been away. Some of you don't know him. But he phrased those, he coined those words. And so we want to bless God. So the challenge to me and you is let's do the best we can. That even when we are not around, the things that we say, we do, we imagine, we plan, we touch other people's lives. Amen. So we do our scripture reading right now. Are you ready? <coughs> We're in Acts chapter 3. It's not long, so just stand with me, please. Let's read as we honor God today. And uh, to give us a break, to just going to uh, stand up a little bit. So it's Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through uh, 7. We're reading from the NIV. If you can't see from the board, then use the Bible where you are. Amen. But it says, one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Together? Oh, that's it? That's it. I was looking up by seven. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, let's, yeah. Let, let's, let's just pray that God will, pray that God will use the preacher to speak to you and pray that God, I'm praying that God will open our ears, amen, uh, as our children go to their service. Uh, don't get distracted. They're just going. Father God, we love you. We bless you. We thank you. Mm. God, we pray for our children and children workers, even as we go teach them to come back and sing. Be with them. And God, as we come to study your word right now, I ask you, Lord, to speak to me again. Speak through me. God, somebody here need an, uh, need an answer, need some assurance. Yeah, maybe I should say need insurance. Guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. So we say Happy New Year again. Happy New Year. And it's good to see all of you. And it's good to be with you in the social media land to our Global Faith family. We are glad that you are here with us. Our study today is in Acts chapter 3, and, uh, and the title for today's message really is Use What You Have. Use What You Have. Just as, I mean, as you have, uh, have your house appraised, in order to know the appreciation or depreciation, the worth, the value, and usefulness, you must also take the time to appraise everything that you have down to the last penny. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. You know, when you go to buy a house or you have a home, you appraise your house so that you know the appreciation or the depreciation or the worth or the value and the usefulness of that house. You must also take time to appraise everything that you have down to the last copper penny. You have it. So it must be of some worth or some usefulness. Whatever you have, 
whatever God has given to you. When the moment comes, uh, maybe you lack the energy and the resources to go out and find something new. When you find yourself in desperation, use what you have. Use what you already have. I mean, it's highly likely that what you will need is already in front of you. Regardless of the appearance, regardless of the size, regardless of the earthly value, God has already given you what you need. It may be a relationship. It may be a responsibility. It may be a vision. It may be a task. It may be something God has given you. The key in using what you have is investing time in knowing what it's worth. Knowing its worth, knowing its usefulness, what you already have may be the very thing that aids you, saves you, or even rescues somebody else. So we come to our story here in Acts chapter 3. You know, if it was in our time, you're watching CNN or MSNBC, it's a breaking news. Healing outside the temple. Yeah, yeah, so, so Luke says in chapter 3, one day, Peter and John, they were going to the temple. So what we're going to look at to investigate this story is we'll look at the, the people involved, who's involved. We'll talk about them, talk about where, talk about when. So we start with the people, that's Peter, James, and John. But the crowd is out there. Everybody's excited. They're talking among themselves, you know, not knowing, you know, exactly what's going on. Somebody's tapping on someone's shoulder. So did I, did I come late? What was it that happened? And somebody said, look at that guy we used to sit at the temple's gate. He's walking. Who's that? The crippled man. How did it happen? He said, uh, there are some followers of Jesus. Peter, a fisherman from Galilee, a follower of Jesus, one who denied Jesus three times. I mean, the guy would speak before he even think, you know, that's the kind of person he was, a rough fellow. But uh, he followed Jesus. Uh, 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 and then also his companion, John, another fisherman, follower of Jesus. But he was from a well-known family. He was educated. You know what I'm saying? And uh, this guy was very vindictive. He did not know about love until he met Jesus. But while he was in the school of Jesus for three years, he learned to love people. So he's called a disciple of love. And uh, then the crowd out there, they're, they're just talking among themselves about what had happened. But let's come to the, the, the mean guy here, the culprit, the lame man, disabled guy who was born from birth. I mean, crippled from birth. The Bible says every day they took him to the temple court, you know, um, to sit there outside the temple by the gate um, um, to, to beg for help for those who come in. Now, in their time, there were no, like, uh, food stamp, no uh, uh, social security. No, no, no. The way the society was set up was those who were disabled, they would bring them to the church, in front of the church. And as people came to church, they gave them arms. Charity. That's how it was done. So, this lame man, crippled from birth, he's sitting there. And the Bible says when Peter and John come in, just like other people, they're asking for money. But let me just say something here before we move on. You know, like this crippled man, where he is, he needs help. But one sure thing, he's not a lazy man. They took him out. To, if you think begging folks for money is not, is not, is, is easy. No, no, talk to me. I'm the one who, uh, I'm, I'm kind of into fundraising business all the time to, to do project, help kids go to school. It's a job. Because sometimes you ask and you get nothing. And then sometimes you ask where you're not expecting, then God just show up. So, but he's there working. So Peter, James, John, Peter and John, two friends who followed Jesus, and the crowd who had come to worship, and the lame man at the temple's gate. So it brings us to the place. Of course, the temple, we mentioned it. You know, it was a place in Jerusalem where everybody went to worship. The same place where Jesus went and drove out uh, people who were changing money. The same place where the Ethiopian eunuch came to worship. He did not find anything until on his way back. Then he met Jesus. The same place where they brought Jesus when he was 12 years old. But it says the gate is called beautiful. 
Archaeologists uh, will tell you more about this gate than I can tell you about. It was magnificent. It was well put together. It was designed. If you stood there, you would see the reflection of the gold and all of that. The backdrop of the stage on which this man stood to beg, it was outstanding. And life is like that. Each of us in this life, we are on a stage. And the backdrop of our stages are different. Some people's backdrop is a beautiful mansion they live in. For some, it's a beautiful Mercedes. For some, it's a job. For some, it's fame. For some, it's money. For some, it's bling, bling. But I want to let you know that all of us, regardless of the, the outlook, the magnificence of the backdrop of our stages, we all have needs. We are going through something. Sometimes you think you are the only one who is going through what you are going through. The Bible says, no, what you are going through, other people are going through the same thing. Whether it's temptation, whether it's trials, whether it's dis uh, discouragement, whether it's disappointment, somebody is going through something. But one thing is sure, God knows your situation different from the rest of the others. And that's what makes him God. I might walk in this room and just see everybody look alike, but God knows uh, the pinch of your shoes. God knows the, the pain you are going through. God knows the question on your mind. God knows what you are thinking about doing right after. The beautiful. This was a place where the power at the church, the place where the power of God resided for those people, a place of devotion and dedication, a place of great anticipation. Why do we come to church, folks? We come to see one another, but we also come to meet the almighty God. I hope that's why we came this morning, and I believe that's why we came when I woke up this morning. God dressed, came to put the heat on to whatever. I knew that God would be meeting with us here today. Hallelujah. And I pray and hope that when you got in here, you have experienced something about God, or before you leave, you would have heard God speak to you. Speak to your situation. Don't go back the way you came. So the people, Peter, James, John, Peter and John, uh, the crowd and the lame man, and then they went to church at the beautiful gate. But why did they go? Uh, 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 Luke says, it was at the hour of prayer, the time of prayer. You know, during those days, Peter, James, and John, the Jewish community, they had three set hours. At 9 o'clock a.m., it's the time of prayer. Everybody expected to go to prayer. At 12 noon, it's the time of prayer. You know, you go, and then 3 p.m. You know, so if you live around Muslims, they don't, they don't, they don't joke about this time. Where I grew up, you know, a lot of people who drive... Uh, uh, commercial vehicles, a lot of these guys, uh, they're, they're, uh, the Mandingo friends, uh, they're Muslims. And when you're on the highway with them when it's prayer time, baby, regardless of your schedule, they're stopping that car. They will stop it, put their mat down, and face Mecca and pray before you leave. So prayer is important. 3 p.m., Peter and John go to church. Men, the Bible says it is good for men to pray. Because when we pray, we encounter the divine nature of God. Through prayer, God is able to work miracles. So God can use simple, common me and you to do something down here that people may not understand. 3 o'clock, uh, uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 1, Peter and John go on to pray. Also look at Acts chapter 10, verse 3. Cornelius, the Roman soldier, at noon, he's going to pray. In Acts chapter 12, verse 12, when Peter is in praising and Herod is about to kill him, so the church gathers at Mary's house to pray, and when they pray, something happened. God sent his angel and took Peter from that prison cell. There is power in prayer. So when you talk to uh, 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 the prophet Elijah, you know, in 1 Kings chapter 36, when he was in a competition with the prophet Baal, Three o'clock, noon time, when it was time for sacrifice, Elijah stopped and prayed and something happened. Fire came from heaven. So let me ask you this. Do you have a set time for prayer? 
when you pray? Do you, do you have an appointment with God and say, God, I'm going to meet you at this time regardless of what happened in my life. I'm going to meet you. So, um, you know, a lot of churches, a lot of Christian communities during the course of the year, they have like 21-day prayer, uh, fasting prayer, and it becomes uh, national stuff. And people do it. Some people do it because everybody else is doing it. BRCC, we're going to pray. But guess what? It's not going to be 21 days today. I mean, this year, we're doing 14 days. We'll do 14 days of serious prayer and fasting so that God will bless our community, our church, to show us how to love one another. That's, that's, that's the, 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 the goal of our prayer, you know, to love one another, for Pastor Gibson to check on Simeon, for Pastor Gibson to check on Jonathan, for Jonathan to check on Bibi, for Bibi to check on McKinsey. Guess what I'm saying? So when we begin to pray for one another, we will know who's here and who's not here. We will know one another's situation and be able to bear one another's burden. And when we do that, we will start edifying one another in this building. That's the focus of our prayer this year. 21 days, I mean, uh, 14 days, and what we are going to do, let me just tell you some of that. Uh, um, we'll start on the, on the 15th, and uh, Monday through Friday, we will set up on Zoom from 5.30 to 6 o'clock. If you're able, join. We'll have evening prayer time. You know, I was thinking about it. I said, maybe let's do small groups and all that. Zoom room is a small group room. When Peter is in prison, everybody met at Mary's house. Zoom will be our Mary's house. You meet, you pray, nothing long. We're not going to keep you. If you have to go to work, pop in. Say, so this is my request or something on my mind. We pray for you while you are going. But prayer is important. There is power in prayer. When you ask Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jail, they pray and God work miracle. He rocked the foundation of the prison just for their sake. So Peter and John, they're going to church, and the Bible says, when this man look at them and he asks for money, Peter says something. He said, Peter, Peter said, look at us, look at us. And the man began to look at them. So their faith, you know, they, they, they all got connected. And then verse 7, so the man was expecting to get something from them. Get some money. I mean, what, 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 what more would you expect? Somebody who needs food and uh, need money to buy detergent, need money to go to the doctor, and they're asking you, they need money, so what are you going to give? So they, this man is expecting money, but look at verse 6. Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. So it tells you that Peter was broke. Yeah, yeah. They've been in Jerusalem for a good while. They came with Jesus. I mean, Passover is done. Crucifixion, resurrection, Pentecost. They've spent everything they have. When you fast forward, Barnabas will be selling his land to bring money to the church. So Peter is broke. But Peter said, you know, yes, I don't have silver, I don't have gold, but I have something. So, so, so from this text, we learn that money is in everything to life. You know, Peter saying, silver or gold, I do not have, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Use what you have. If Peter had focused on what he did not have, he was going to pass by that man and say, you know what, I don't have anything right now, we'll see you next time. Or maybe when I go home, I borrow money from Mary Magdalene or somebody and come back. No, no, no. But Peter said, I will focus on what I have. Why? Because he's been with Jesus before. He was on the mountainside when Jesus' people began to come and Jesus was teaching them. More than 5,000 people came. They were hungry. No food. And Jesus said, feed these people. Peter, James, and John others said, Lord, the place is too far. We don't have anything. Andrew went around, saw a little boy with five loaves of bread. And Peter saw Jesus multiply. Five loaves. Sometimes you think, you know, life is just giving up on you and your back is at the wall and you don't have any way out, nobody to help you. I want to let you know there is always help when you look to Jesus. That's why the psalmist said, I lift up my eyes to the hills from whence come my help. If you know where to look, who to look to, who to ask, your, your needs will be met. So uh, um, Peter said, we have Jesus. And the Bible said Peter gave him, extended his hand. The man received it by faith. Peter pulled him up. And his anger bones started coming together. Something strange began to happen in this man's life. So why is it that the people who passed by this man for several years did not help him? 
We're not able to help him. Some gave him money, yet yeah, enough maybe that he needed, less than he needed. Some did not look his way. You know how it is when you're driving by and passing by people who are up, I mean, on the side of the road begging for money? Sometimes you don't have it, you don't even want to look at them because you'll be embarrassed. Uh huh. You're waiting, praying for the light to change real quick for you to move on. Yeah. But when this man began to walk, the Bible said, those who stood around, they were amazed. And that's what God can do. When God began to work in and through you, people who were around, who knew you before, who knew who you were, maybe how uh, you, you had a lot of temper, maybe how you talked too fast, maybe how you were stingy, maybe how you, know, you just did not care for anybody, maybe you were wistful. Now they see you are a new person. Your life is in order and it's in control. So uh, there's a story in the Old Testament that you can you know, kind of like parallel with this. And this is in 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, but especially verse 2, it tells a story about this widow, a preacher's wife. Her husband was a prophet. Served God, faithful, committed to God. And um, he did his part, and then God called him home. But the Bible said when the man died, guess what? Uh, um, debt collectors. I don't know whether it was the man's debt or the man's wife and children, credit but debt collectors started calling. You know how it is when debt collectors are calling you, right? I mean, they don't give up. They don't give up. They were intimidated, you know. Uh, they want to garnish your check. They want to, I mean, do all kinds of stuff to you. They wanted to get, get the credit card and pay right now, right now. But the lady was in trouble. And so it says, you know, it's just then when Elijah, I mean, Elijah has become a prophet and God's going to want test him, put his work to uh, make the people to trust in him. So Elisha comes, and this widow comes and says, Sir, my children, uh, the debt collectors have come to sell my children. And Elisha said, What do you have in your house? <laughs> what, what, what? What do you have in your refrigerator? What do you have on the counter? What do you have in your closet? You know, some of us, sometimes, you know, I look in my closet, I've seen a uh, quarter, two, three, I have not worn in six years. But then, you know, my human self will say, oh, I don't have clothes to wear. Just go and look in your closet. <laughs> I mean, you, know, you keep, keep moving, you see colors. You see shoes. You, I'm so, so we have what we need. Elisha said, what do you have in your house? She said, sir, your servant has nothing except a little jar of oil. You see, now you, you're giving God something to work with. If you focus on the nothing, then you will accomplish nothing. If you focus on the nothing, you will go after nothing. But if just that little thing that God has given you. So, 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 the prophet said now that you have a little jar of oil in your house, Make the best of what you have. Yes, yes. The oil was to be multiplied by the pouring. So you go through the Bible, you know, and, and you check with men of God like Noah. What did you say, Noah? What did you have when God called you to build an ark? Noah said, I had time. Time, time. Time to save my family. Abraham, what did you have when God called you to leave your family? He said, Simple trust in God, knowing that God will direct my path. The God who calls is able to lead you. Moses, what did you have when God called you to confront the mighty Pharaoh? He said, I had a rod that God gave me. David, the shepherd, what did you have when facing Goliath? A sling and a stone. The lad, what did you have? Five loaves. So, BRCC, what do you have? God's given us faith. God's given us facility to, to, to share our faith and to love people through, to, to nurture the disciple, the tree, to build up families. Now it's your turn. What do you have? What do you have? You see, success is guaranteed only when you appreciate the potential value of the resources within your reach. 
It's what God has given you. When you look around and you, you, you are aware of your environment, what you have, when you appreciate the potential that it has, then success is on its way. So it is a quality of what we present to God that will make a difference in our lives and in the lives of other people around us. So the, the widow took the oil and the prophet said, go out and borrow some vessels. Not few, say, borrow as many as you can. So her and her two sons went out, they borrowed the vessels, they came back in the room, guess what? He, he said, lock the door. Why? Because you don't want distraction. You don't want anybody kind of getting your attention. You want to focus your attention on what God has called you to do. They locked the door and they began to pour the oil and they began to pour the oil and began to pour the oil until they got to the last vessel that she, brought, she borrowed. When all got in there was filled, her son said, there's no more than the oil stop. And that's how God works. God will provide your need when you need it. Yes, he's a person, person to the Philippians. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. So when you need it, he will provide. God will not waste resources. When they had the last jar and everything got in there, it stopped. But guess what? Who was the one pouring the oil? It was the woman. Not the prophet, not her sons. You see what God has given you to work with? It's only in your hands that it will prosper. Let the church say amen. Yes, what we have will increase best in our own hands. Your vision. Somebody can tell that story better than you can. The book that God has placed on your heart to write, only you can write it better. The, 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 the business God has called you to start, only you can start it because when the trials and the challenges come, you will be the only one who is equipped to handle those. God wants to help us, but he wants us to be a responsible part of the process. So like the Israelites crossing the, the, the Jordan River to go into the promised land, Joshua's instruction to the people and the priests were, so follow the priest. When they put their foot in the water, God will work a miracle. God will only work the miracle when they put their foot in the water. I believe as long as they stood by the, the shore of the Jordan River and not put their foot in the water as God instructed, they're going to stay there for eternity. But when they obey God and put their foot in the water, God stopped the water from flowing. So the key to your success is to obey. The key to the success of, for Moses was raising your hand. God said raise the hand. And he did. The key to the success of the